The Cavalcade of America, starring Lionel Barrymore. Tonight, the DuPont Company brings you Return to Glory, starring Lionel Barrymore on The Cavalcade of America. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Unfinished Dance, starring Margaret O'Brien. Now, Return to Glory, starring Lionel Barrymore as John Quincy Adams on The Cavalcade of America. Mr. Richardson, you suggest that I should run for Congress, <laughs> an ex-president? Why not, Mr. Adams? Father? Yes, Charles? I wouldn't consider it if I were you. Hmm. It would be undignified, even degrading, sir. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, but it was my thought you would elevate the office without degrading yourself. Mr. Richardson? Charles? You're both wrong. The office needs no elevation. As you call it. But, Father, to, to serve in the lower house of Congress? If the people ask me, I'd be glad to serve as a town clerk. Then you'll accept, Mr. Adams? Uh, on one condition, sir. And that is? I will be responsible to no party, to no section, but only to my conscience and the nation. <laughs> That was an early fall day in the year 1830 in the old family home at Quincy, Massachusetts. Two years before, my husband, John Quincy Adams, had left the White House, defeated by Andrew Jackson. And now, well, now he was going back to Washington as a congressman. So he felt he was not a failure, that the people wanted him, needed him. But there were others in Congress who thought otherwise. Well, gentlemen, we're agreed on this, then? Unquestionably. On every point. Good. No more petitions, especially those asking for the abolition of slavery. It's better for Congress and the country if they're left unread. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Marshall, what, what about John Quincy Adams? <laughs> There'll be no trouble with him. He's happy enough to be back in public service. Well, I don't know. An ex-president... Exactly. Holding on to a remnant of former glory. <laughs> <laughs> He's an old man. Confused by President Jackson's easy victory two years ago. No, gentlemen, we have nothing to fear from John Quincy Adams. The old war horse has lost his fire. Just be careful. Here he comes. Well, the gentleman from Massachusetts. Good morning, Mr. Adams. Good morning, gentlemen. Glad you came along, Mr. Adams. There's something we should like to talk over with you. Oh, fine, Mr. Marshall. Fine. Right. What is it? Mr. Adams, it's probably been obvious to you, too, that Congress has reached the limit of its patience. Too many petitions, you know. Understand? Oh, uh, well, I hadn't noticed. After you've been here for a while, Mr. Adams, you'll see what we mean. But what about the people? They sent us here. It's their yes, right. Yes, of to... course, of course. But many petitions should go on read for the good of Congress and the Union. For instance, why disturb the South over this so-called right to petition? It's better to let sleeping dogs lie, eh? <laughs> you understand, of course. Oh, oh, I do. I do. Excellent. I see we're all going to get along very well. Mm. Now, uh, shall we go into session? John Adams. John Adams. Yeah? yeah? What is it? Excuse me. I should like a word with you. Mr. Adams is just about to go into session. Just a moment. Just a moment. What is it, sir? I have a petition. A petition? Now, see here, sir. I beseech thee, John Adams, to present this humble petition to Congress. One moment. You're a Quaker, aren't you? I am, sir, from Pennsylvania. Then why not ask your own representative <clears throat> to read it, sir? Exactly, Mr. Marshall. And uh, now, sir, if you'll excuse us... If it please thee, our representative is afraid to read it. Huh? What's that? Afraid? Well, what's it for? Let me see it. Oh, come along, Mr. Adams. It's probably another petition for the abolition of slavery. Yes, 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 yes. That's just what it is. It asks for the abolition of the slave trade here in the District of Columbia... And then for the abolition of slavery. Our representative is afraid we abolitionists will end by destroying the union of it these states. So am I. But thee cannot favor slavery. I hate slavery, sir. All kinds. 
But uh, under the Constitution, Congress can do nothing short of its war powers to abolish slavery. I disagree with you, sir. Oh, of course, you're very right, Mr. Adams. And now, sir, if you will excuse just us... Just a moment, just a moment, Mr. Marshall. I said I disagree, and I do. But I think this citizen should have the right to have his petition presented before Congress. And since his own representative won't do it, uh, I shall read it for him. What? Is this some joke, Mr. Adams? Since when has the people's right to petition Congress become a joke? Well, I, I didn't mean that. Oh, I'm glad. And you, sir, rest assured your petition will be read. Now, good day. I thank you. Good day. Mr. Adams, you didn't mean that. We had an understanding, sir. We did? <laughs> I understood you. But I'm afraid you misunderstood me. I am duty-bound to present any and all petitions. Now, if you will excuse me, gentlemen, I'm late. Well, Marshal, now? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. But he's going to read that petition. Of course he is. Let him. <laughs> he's still hanging on to that remnant of glory. He'll let go soon enough. Or we'll find a way to stop him. <laughs> But that petition wasn't the only one my husband read. As the days went by, he read many more. He gave his allegiance to no party or section, but only to the people themselves. Then, one day in the house... Mr. Speaker! Mr. Speaker! Gentlemen from Massachusetts! I have a petition to read. <laughs> this is a petition asking for the abolition of slavery. Oh, no, not another one, no. Not another one. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, sir. This petition quotes the Declaration of Independence that all men are created free and equal. Will the gentleman from Massachusetts yield for a question? I yield for a question. I should like to know his views on slavery. My views, sir, are of no consequence. I am here solely to serve the people of this country. Their right to petition Congress on any subject is part of their freedom. I will read these petitions as long as they're sent to me. Will the gentleman from Massachusetts yield for a minute? I yield, but only for a minute. This will take only a minute. Hmm. Mr. Speaker, I move that hereafter this House reject unread all petitions regarding slavery. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker! I demand to be heard. It's my right to be heard. There's a motion before the House... And I have the right to speak against it. Gentlemen, the very first article of our Bill of Rights guarantees the right of the people to petition the government for redress of grievances. Deny that privilege, and next a free press will be denied. And then free speech will be denied. And in the end, we shall lose all our liberties. Question. There shall be... Seconded that the House reject without reading all petitions regarding slavery. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? No! The motion is carried, and so ended as Rule 25. The resolution just passed is a gag in the mouth of free speech. It is a direct violation of the Constitution. But it's a rule just the same now, Mr. Adams. <laughs> and I'll fight it until my dying breath to have such a gag rule wiped out. <laughs> week after week, John fought against the gag rule. Weeks went into months, and he would not give up. Like a malicious litany, the words of his opponents smashed against him. The gentleman from Massachusetts is out of order. Mr. Adams forgets there is a rule against reading that petition. The gentleman from Massachusetts knows rule number 25 prohibits this petition. I have a petition against slavery. Out of order!
I watched him tiring. I saw the lines on his face deepen, the shadows under his eyes darken. Then one night... Louisa, is that you? Yes, John. Do you know what time it is? Time? No, I don't think I do. It's almost light outside. Huh. You've been working all night. I didn't notice. Uh, there's so much to be done, so much. Stop for a while, John. I can't, my dear, I can't. Not so long as the people send me these petitions to be read. Are there any on slavery? Uh huh? Hmm? You'll read them. The first sentence, at least. I talk fast, you know, and, and what I say must go into the records. But these petitions, they're... <laughs> what are you going to say? John, this isn't a petition. Oh, Louisa... Give that to me. You weren't going to tell me about this letter. Oh, there's no reason to. A threat against your life. Nah. John, how many of these have you received? <laughs> oh, now, now, now. The writers are just cranks. They hate you. Not enough for that. They do. Oh, stop it, Louisa. This is not worth the worry. John, you've got to stop. No, no, Louisa. No, 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 no. Let someone else fight now. You've done enough. No man ever does enough, Louisa. Tyranny and oppression find their way easily through any crack in the armor of democracy. The gag rule is that crack. For my sake, John, please, for my sake. Ah, I wish you hadn't said that. Well, you won't think of yourself. That's right. Nor even of you now. John. Ah, I hate to say that. Because I love you more than anything in the world, Louisa. But... No matter what comes or whom it may hurt, I'll keep on fighting. And he kept fighting, and he received more letters threatening his life. Then one night, he went to Gatsby's tavern. <laughs> well, well, will you look at that. John Quincy himself. Uh, it's Adams. Good evening, gentlemen. Mr. Adams. Uh, good evening, sir. Mr. Adams, it's... Uh... It's a surprise to see you here. Judging by the reception, it must be, Senator Clay. Will you join me at my table, sir? Thank you, no, Senator. I didn't come here to enjoy myself, but for quite a different reason. You'll excuse me, sir. Mr. Marshall, I should especially like you to hear what I'm going to say. I'm sorry, but I have business elsewhere. Your discourtesy matches your tactics. <laughs> Oh, sir, I could wish you were a younger man. Gentlemen, now, gentlemen, please. Never mind, Senator. I'm sure Mr. Marshall remembers my age. I do, sir. Please excuse me. Wait. What I have to say won't take long. Then get it over with. This is not the floor of a house where parliamentary rules protect you and keep others bored by your so-called eloquence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Today I received another letter threatening my life. Are you accusing me, Mr. Adams? I am not. Whatever weapons you choose, sir, I am sure they would not be anonymous. I shall cherish that praise from you, sir. Please do. But even if the writer of those letters were in this room now, I should still say what I came here to say. Mr. Adams, please. I will not be silenced. The letters don't worry me at all, gentlemen. But they do cause my wife extreme anxiety. Now, however, even that will not stop me from continuing my fight. Someday you will go too far, Mr. Adams. And God grant it's in the right direction. No one need kill you, sir. You're drawing your own noose. Perhaps I am, Mr. Marshall. But so far, it's not tight enough to choke off my voice. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough of this stupidity. Now, excuse me. Please, sir, sit with me a moment. All right, Senator Clay, my business here is over. They are waiting for you to make one false move, one slip. And then, since they can't silence you any other way, they'll try to get rid of you, son. Force you from office. Not perhaps. Perhaps. But even in that event, I will not stop what I set out to do. Kill that gag rule. <laughs> You are listening to Return to Glory, starring Lionel Barrymore as John Quincy Adams on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry.
elected to Congress, ex-president John Quincy Adams fights against the gag rule prohibiting the reading of petitions on slavery. But slavery is not the issue. It is the right of Americans to petition that is being endangered by the rule. As the second part of our story opens, his wife, Louisa, continues. Time passed, and the people heard what John was doing. He gained some supporters. Each time his motion for repeal of the gag rule was put before the House, there were one or two more in favor. Then, one day in the House, when he had the floor... I have a petition from 46 citizens of Haverhill, Massachusetts, praying for the peaceable dissolution of the Union. I move... of this petition to a select committee with instructions to report why the petition should not be granted. Satisfied, Mr. Marshall? No. In merely bringing this petition before us, you are guilty of high treason, contempt of this house, and guilty of a high breach of privilege. You forget I asked for its rejection by a committee. I move the Honorable John Quincy Adams deserves expulsion from Congress for giving aid and comfort to the enemies of the Union. Aid and comfort to those who would dissolve it. I demand to be heard on this, Mr. Speaker. I have the floor. The gentleman from Massachusetts has the floor. Let the clerk read the last sentence of the first paragraph from the Declaration of Independence. Let him read it. Clerk will do so. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Let no one seek to destroy this government. But it is our right and our duty to preserve its liberties. There would be no such right if the people lost the power of petition. Gentlemen... There will be foreign despotisms and ideologies that will seek to destroy us. But I say to you that we will lose the power to defend ourselves against those if we stifle the right to defend ourselves against our own oppression. Crush the right to petition, destroy it if you will, but at the same time take the words that were just read by the clerk and do this to them. Mr. Speaker, if the gentleman from Massachusetts withdraws the petition, I'll withdraw the resolution for his expulsion. I will not withdraw a single word. Expel me if you like, but not one word of any petition will I withdraw. He was not expelled, but the fight weakened him, did what his enemies could not forced him to rest. But the people had heard, and they did answer as we took a trip around the country John loved so much. Maybe I'm sick. But if you have petitions, send them to me. I implore you, send them to me. It's your right as Americans. It was the same everywhere, and the people's voice was heard. John planned to continue the fight as soon as he got back, but sickness stopped him. Louisa? Yes, John. You're supposed to be sleeping. Uh, I'm not. I don't feel like it. Lie back, dear. I want my clothes. What did you do with them? You're staying where you are. I warn you, Louisa, as soon as you're out of this room, I'll go to Congress, as I am. Don't you want to get well? But I'm not sick. It's time for your medicine. I'll get... John, what did you do with it? Uh, it had a vile taste. 
I threw it into the fireplace. I can get more. No doubt, no doubt. Louisa, I tell you that... <coughs> I guess I am a little tired. Of course you are, Jack. But I'm not sick, Louisa. I tell you I'm not sick. But he was. And it was months before he went back to Washington, to Congress. I remember that day. One of the members had the floor. Then John entered. There was a stir. Every eye in the house turned to watch as he walked slowly down the aisle toward his seat. The member stopped speaking. As one man, the house got to its feet, stood for the man who not too long before they had fought against. Well, I wish to thank the members of the house for their courtesy. Welcome back, Mr. Adams. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, am I in order for a motion, Mr. Speaker? Chair will entertain your motion, Mr. Adams. No petitions, Mr. Adams. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, sir, I have a portfolio full of them. And I intend to read them later. <laughs> First... I move that House Rule Number Twenty Five, the gag rule, be stricken out. It has been moved and seconded that this House strike out Rule Twenty Five. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. You've won, sir. You've won your fight. Not I, Mr. Johnson. Not I. <laughs> Gentlemen, my young colleague. Mr. Andrew Johnson has just said that I won my fight. Well, that's not true. You, gentlemen, you've won because you've remembered that liberty is more than just a word. Freedom means that we Americans will always be guaranteed the right to say so if we think something's wrong. But this freedom must be guarded today and tomorrow and by everybody. May God Grant us the courage and strength forever to fight for it. Thank you, Mr. Barrymore. Ladies and gentlemen, Lionel Barrymore will return in just a moment with a very important message for you. Now, here is Gain Whitman. Today, the American Chemical Society opens its 112th national meeting in New York. The knowledge and skill of these chemists, both men and women, have helped to bring us many of the good things of life we now regard as everyday conveniences. At one time or another, for instance, more than 200 of our own DuPont chemists and engineers worked to perfect what is known today as DuPont nylon. You may be surprised to hear that nylon as a fiber is finding many uses as an industrial material. The same built-in ruggedness, which makes it so good for stockings, is of value in industrial jobs. In a textile mill in New England, to name one such job, nylon rope is being used to drive belts to transmit power. Where the old ropes lasted only about seven weeks, the nylon ones are still running after 16 months. Filter cloth to screen products like flour and cornstarch is now made of this DuPont fiber, which lasts four and five times as long as the former material. But perhaps the toughest job we've heard of so far is something the laundrymen are doing with this tough baby nylon. When you send your clothes to the laundry, they are kept separate from other people's clothes by putting them into special laundry bags or nets. These nets are washed over and over again all day long. It would be hard to imagine any tougher test for any material. Laundrymen tell us nylon nets are lasting four times longer on the average than any others they were ever able to find. Here is an interesting comment on the eagerness with which Americans try and accept new products. This new fiber, which first captivated women because of its delicate beauty and wearability and hosiery, because it is one of the toughest fibers ever placed at the service of industry, will benefit you in many ways. If you would like a booklet 
telling how DuPont nylon is made and how to take care of it, we'll be glad to send you one free of charge. Just write to the radio section, DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware, and ask for the booklet about DuPont nylon, which is, of course, one of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. The Freedom Train. Our Constitution is 160 years old this week. On Wednesday, Constitution Day, a special train is scheduled to begin a nationwide tour in Philadelphia, the cradle of American liberty. It's called the Freedom Train, and it will visit 300 American cities during the next 12 months. Aboard are scores of priceless documents which have created and which guarantee our American freedoms. Jefferson's own draft of the Declaration of Independence. George Washington's own copy of the Constitution and our American Bill of Rights. For more than 10 years, the DuPont Cavalcade of America has urged Americans to rededicate themselves to the great ideals of our American heritage. Now is the time to refresh our memories, to talk with our families and friends about what it means to be an American. As Adam said, freedom must be guarded today and tomorrow by everybody. Freedom is everybody's job. Back in 1885, Belva Lockwood, like all American women, could not legally vote in a national election. But there was no law that prevented her from becoming president of the United States. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade of America presents Virginia Bruce as Belva Lockwood, who accepted the nomination for the nation's highest office and won her fight for women's rights. Remember, next Monday night, Virginia Bruce is the girl who ran for president on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. The music for the DuPont Cavalcade is composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Tonight's cavalcade was written by Garrett Porter. Jane Morgan played the part of Louisa Adams. This is Frank Bingman inviting you to listen next week to The Girl Who Ran for President, starring Virginia Bruce on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. The DuPont Cavalcade of America came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.